Welcome, everybody. I think we're going to start getting started. We want to make sure we have plenty of time. I know there's still a few folks coming in, but uh, welcome to the Global School Forum and the opening keynote panel of the New England Council of Latin American Studies Conference, which we are thrilled to be hosting here at WPI today and tomorrow. Um, I'm going to invite everyone. I know, well, the room, I guess we have split screens. I was going to say everybody should move to the front, but I guess you can, as long as you can see everything where you are, you're okay. But um, we are in a big room because we were using it for an event all earlier today. So um, feel free to move closer if you want to. Um, so my name is Mimi Scheller. I'm the Dean of the Global School. And uh, as I was saying, the New England Council of Latin American Studies is holding their annual meeting here this, um, today and tomorrow. And more than 100 scholars and students from across the Northeast will be here to discuss their research on bridging knowledges, technologies, and cultures in Latin America and the Caribbean. And First, I want to begin by thanking the NECLAS Executive Committee and the conference organizers for choosing WPI as your location for the conference. Um, I want to thank our phenomenal faculty team in Latin American and Caribbean studies who have been instrumental in coordinating and planning this event. So Latin American Caribbean studies faculty conference organizers, please stand for a second and be recognized. Come on. Thank you all. Done a great job. Um, I also want to thank um, the, some of the sponsors of uh, the events today and tomorrow, including our partners at Smith College, the WPI School of Arts and Sciences, the Humanities and Arts Department, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Multicultural Education, and the Global School which is sponsoring tonight's special keynote panel as part of our Global School Forum. I also want to thank our incredible staff from the Global School who have helped bring this together and are supporting this event. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, Candice, Dawn, is Dawn here? Th let me give them also a round of applause. So the Global School Forum focuses each year on some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this year, we are especially highlighting the goal of climate action, which has run through many of our um, speakers last year as well as this year, it, because it aligns in part with our graduate program in community climate adaptation. And I see some of our graduate students here also. And, um, we're really excited to have this program, as well as, uh, just to let you know, we have a new master's degree in global health that we'll be launching next year. And we're really interested in this intersection between climate and health as well. The Global School is WPI's hub for interdisciplinary experiential learning. And we have taken seriously the need to move forward WPI's commitment to education for local and global sustainability, including climate adaptation. And we do this as leaders in project-based learning that addresses this really complex kind of local um, experiences of the challenges around health, energy, environment, food, water, mobilities, all of these things that come together in this intersecting way as they touch down in particular places and for individual people. As you, I'm sure, know, on our planet, we've just lived through the eight warmest years on record, right? We continue to expect the coming years to grow even hotter. Overall, the world is now 1.2 degrees Celsius or 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it was in the second half of the 19th century, which is when we start measuring how the emissions of planet warming carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels became widespread and has increased uh, the heat of the planet since then. We know that these effects are felt all around the world. Um, 2022, I'm sure you remember, um, Eastern and Central China, Pakistan and India, all experienced lengthy extreme heat waves. There were the monsoon floods devastating Pakistan, the extensive wildfires in the Western United States, 
And then this year of 2023, so far, has brought extreme heat across Europe, the Americas, the Caribbean, and around the world. The devastating floods that were seen in Libya and Brazil, the typhoons in Asia, and the wildfires that raged through Canada and places like the island of Maui in Hawaii. While all of us experience the effects of that changing climate, small islands have been at the forefront of raising the alarm about extreme impacts on their ecology, their people, their economies, and their cultures. Pacific and Caribbean island leaders in particular have been leading the call for reducing greenhouse gases globally and advocating for the payment of loss and damages to help repair the effects that they have felt from the changing climate. So, you know, from the island of Vanuatu, there was the beginning of some of these calls. More recently, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, has been sort of spearheading some of the calls for loss and damages and the reduction of greenhouse gases globally. In the Americas, the impacts of climate change are one of the factors driving migration across the hemisphere, and we know how that's been impacting Latin America, Central America, and North America um, as we see the political fallout that comes when people get alarmed over migration and a fear of what is sometimes described as climate migration, but it's actually a complex constellation of many different factors that lead to the displacement of people. So cent Central America and the Caribbean islands in particular have felt the impact with thousands, tens of thousands of smallhold farmers who've been driven off their land and fisher folk who've lost their livelihoods. And hurricanes are driving a lot of climate displacement. So to address some of these issues in today's Global School Forum, we will hear from leading scholars of climate adaptation, climate education, climate financing, who all happen to come from Jamaica. This was a bit of a coincidence, but we have the, the Jamaican posse here. And let me introduce our brilliant and wonderful panelists. First, we have Dr. Stacey Ann Robinson, who is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Dean of Global Engagement at Colby College. She teaches international environmental policy and global climate policy. Her scholarship investigates the human, social, and policy dimensions of climate change adaptation in small island developing states. She focuses on climate justice and adaptation finance. And she was a contributing author to chapter 15 on small islands of working group two's contribution to the sixth assessment report of the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the one that was released in February 2022. Her work has appeared in Nature, Nature Climate Change, um, Climate Policy, and many other leading journals. Our second panelist, and actually they're going to go in reverse order, uh, is Kevon Riney, who is an associate professor of human environment geography at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, and Barron, visiting professor of environmental humanities at the High Meadows Environmental Institute based at Princeton University. His primary research examines the conditions that drive social and environmental change in the Caribbean and the social material implications these changes pose for already marginalized groups. Dr. Riney has co-edited two books and his work has been featured in interdisciplinary journals such as Geoforum, Climatic Change, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and many others. Third, we'll hear from um, our own Worcester-based colleague, Dr. Nigel Brissett, who is Associate Professor of International Development Community and Environment at Clark University here in Worcester. Dr. Brissett's scholarship examines education policy reform in the Caribbean in the context of larger global education and socioeconomic development forces. His work focuses on current educational structures and policies in the Caribbean community, which we call CARICOM, in three focus areas. First, human resource development and high skill em skilled emigration. Secondly, global discourses of sustainable development and critical responses for and from the Caribbean. And third, education policy reform for educational equity in Jamaica. 
His work has appeared in journals such as Comparative Education Review, Race, Ethnicity, and Education, the Journal of Environmental Education, and many others. Um, and finally, I'll be participating in the panel as well because I myself as a, am an interdisciplinary scholar with interests in Caribbean studies, mobilities research, and social theory. And I'll be talking a little bit more today about these two grants that um, a co-PI and PI from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration working with the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network. And I'll just mention this interest work draws on my 2020 book, Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who will be Dr. Riney. Thanks, Mimi, for that intro. Um, and to Dawn Farmer, I'm not sure if she's here, for organizing the logistics. Um, uh, well done. And it's really great being here uh, to just kind of talk about a topic that is very important to, to me because of the fact that clearly I'm from the Caribbean. Um, I have a personal story. I lost my grandfather in 1988 to Hurricane Gilbert. Um, and that has played a big role in terms of you know, my interest in geography. Um, and the 2017 hurricane season, kind of you know, seeing what was happening in Puerto Rico and across the Caribbean kind of um, in some ways pulled me in to kind of explore some of the geopolitical tensions that we were seeing emerging across the Caribbean um, and now looking at how those tensions um, in many ways overlapped with issues of sovereignty or non-sovereignty, race, and, and underlying um, structural inequalities. And so to some extent, my talk is very, kind of very broad in terms of just thinking about climate resilience and how like, you could think about the ways in which climate resilience is being mobilized um, under conditions of increasing uncertainty and risk, and also in some ways pushing back on the idea of resilience in terms of thinking about what exactly do we mean when we talk about resilience. Um, resilience for who? Um, who gets to frame um, the kind of solutions to the problems that we're facing, and how those solutions, in some cases, uh, can complicate or, um, in, 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 in many, as, a, as, as you'll see, in our discussion, in some cases, it can actually um, make people's situations worse because of the ways in which uh, resilience tends to um, prioritize a return to the status quo. And for many people, returning to the status quo is a return to violence and instability, right? So there's a, a need to kind of question that. Um, so if we think, if we think about the big picture, um, all of the indicators are <laughs> pointing in the wrong direction, right? Um, we're seeing where it's projected that we might breach the 1.5 target as early as the 2030s. Um, we're seeing increasing levels of sea level rise. Between 1880 and present day, we've seen a, an increase in, in the average mean sea level by between eight to nine um, inches. But what's also interesting is since 1993, we've seen an increase of four inches. So you're seeing this like, it's getting worse. The, the rate of change is increasing significantly. Um, and you know, we, I want to kind of position today's talk within this kind of broader picture of you know, and warming and increasingly warming climate and with that increasing levels of instabilities in our global ecological systems, right? Um, and kind of tied to that is as you're thinking about um, these changes, there is this like growing need for us um, to support adaptation measures. And what we've seen in recent years is that there's this huge gap in adaptation financing. Um, and so, you know, public, public adaptation costs will only reach around 0.25% of global gross domestic product per year in coming decades. And, you know, the general kind of understanding is that that is just not enough, 
um, there is this big um, gap that needs to be filled. And we've seen in recent COPs how problematic this, this gets and the, the amount of geopolitical tensions, particularly from um, developed countries, um, you know, not wanting to make big, these big commitments. Uh, and so in, in many ways, what you're seeing is that um, the annual needs uh, are going to get um, in worse in terms of as you start to see these changes taking place, there's going to be more and more money needed for adaptation. And you're going to see that coming primarily from developing countries. And it may be even larger for small island nations exposed to like tropical cyclones and rising seas. Um, you know, when, a, when one hurricane hits a, a, a Caribbean island, it's the entire island that gets impacted, right? Um, in 2004, um, Hurricane Ivan impacted Grenada. Um, the impacts came up to roughly $900 million, um, US dollars in terms of losses and damages, which was over 200% of the country's GDP that year. Um, we've also seen this with uh, St. Martin, uh, in 2017, when they were impacted by Hurricane Irma, um, the estimates were $2.6 billion in terms of loss and damages, and that was at roughly 130% of that country's GDP. So, you know, as, you, as we start to move into a warmer climate, um, and as we, these, these islands start to become more and more exposed to these huge hurricanes in terms of their intensity, um, you're going to see that there's going to be, you know, need for these kind of adaptation um, funding. Um, and so, you know, what we've seen is despite this growing need for adaptation funding, despite um, the advocacy of many leaders from developing countries and from small island states, um, we've not been able to meet any of the targets that we've set forth to, to achieve. And in fact, what we've seen is a, a decline in, in adaptation funding. Um, and on the contrary, you've seen, or in contrast, you've seen this increase in mitigation funding. And there's a kind of a reason for that. Um, with the rise of carbon markets, obviously, there is a lot of um, capitalist interest in capitalizing on these carbon markets. And so in many ways, mitigation is becoming a, a, a developmental strategy for many like new firms trying to kind of cash in on these rising carbon markets. And um, in the case of adaptation funding, which in many cases you can't really get any return from adaptation funding, you can't see those returns at least not until 20, 25, 30 years down, down the line. There is this like lack of a lack of interest in adaptation funding versus mitigation funding, uh, and of course that has serious material consequences for the developing world. So we we have this kind of implementation gap, um, where you know a lot of the countries that um, really need the kind of support in terms of adaptation, they often lack the means to to mobilize these funds. Um, typically, they, they lack financing and institutional capacity. Um, and so what you, what you have is that the countries that are most exposed to heat waves, droughts, storms, sea level rise, often confront these challenges in accessing funding, but they also have to deal with press, other pressing development um, issues at the same time. So it's like this kind of double inequality that you, that you see emerging. Um, so the big point here is that it is important, it's more important now than ever before to, to invest in resilient growth with, adapt with adaptation fully integrated with other sustainable development goals. And that's kind of the broad kind of call that, that I want to kind of make with my, with my presentation. And of course, SIDS, small island developing states, um, occupy a very unique position here because of their kind of inherent um, characteristics that make them disproportionately vulnerable to future climate, um, climatic changes. Um, because of their small geographic size, their high exposure to, and vulnerability to climate phenomena, I mean, just being in the Caribbean means that in, in any given year, a country can be impacted by one or two different uh, tropical storms or hurricanes. Um, they also have fragile economies, open, um, fragile ecosystems, open economies, limited natural resources, all of which compounds their, their vulnerability to um, future changes 
And based off the projections, I mean, this is just to show that, you know, there's these like different storylines. Of course, many SIDS have been pushing for a cap, trying to keep um, future warming to be below two degrees Celsius. That was a big um, push at Paris Agreement. Um, but again, as what you, what, based off what we're seeing, you know, it, we are nowhere near to um, the meeting the Paris Agreement. Um, by one, by 20, early 2030s, we will more likely pass the 1.5 threshold, moving towards two degrees Celsius by 2050s. Um, and the, this, this obviously the storylines is as you move from one scenario to the next, it gets worse, right? In terms of particularly hurricanes, or what the models are saying is that you might not necessarily see an increase in the frequency of hurricanes, but you will start to see more stronger hurricanes emerging. So you expect to see more kind of three and over kind of category, uh, category three plus hurricanes emerging. Um, which is basically this, and and, and, and and this slide is really just, just to capture just the magnitude of a hurricane. And you could see um, this particular image, there is a, it's an image of um, St. Martin, you could probably see bits of uh, Puerto Rico um, there, but you can just see how huge these, these systems are. Um, so, you know, a lot of my work has been looking at post-hurricane recovery efforts in the Caribbean, particularly in St. Martin. Um, and I'm happy to talk some more about that. I don't think I have enough time to do that. Um, but this is just to show you, you know, some of the pictures for, uh, after Hurricane um, Irma in 2017 to get a sense of, you know, the kind of the, the devastation um, that took place. Up to 90% of the infrastructure on the island was impacted. Um, and, you know, the work that I'm doing is really tracing the, tracing the slow, ongoing recovery efforts happening um, in that country. And so what does climate resilient, uh, climate resilient future look like for the Caribbean? You know, it, 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 what we've seen since the 2017 hurricane season is what I think Kevin Grove calls absurd geographies, right? We are like in many cases kind of tied to Naomi Klein's argument around disaster capitalism is in the case of Puerto Rico, government was pushing to, to move away from public school systems to chartered school systems. We've seen the privatization of public beaches. We've seen attempts to privatize um, formerly commonly owned lands in, um, in Aruba, um, in Barbuda, sorry. Um, and so, you know, there is a need for us to kind of really think through uh, notions about you know, what, what we mean by resilience, um, particularly in terms of the ways in which a lot of these like adaptation and resilience building efforts tend to be more market based and top down. Um, and so I am particularly interested in kind of thinking about ways in which we can build resilience from the bottom up and kind of thinking about different types of models for building resilience. Um, and I've been drawing a lot of inspiration from the, solidar from the solidarity brigades that emerged in Puerto Rico um, in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria, where groups of community members banded together to create community kitchens to go back to the lands and to resuscitate farmlands. Um, and those uh, networks are growing, um, building up diasporic um, connections with Puerto Ricans in the United States, going back in the summer, doing voluntary work, and so on. And so kind of thinking about other types of models for building resilience while holding the state accountable. Um, so I'm happy to talk um, some more about that. Um, we just have about 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I should have said at the beginning, I forgot that we're starting with these brief 10-minute presentations by each speaker to sort of give the context and a little bit about their research. And then after we've each done a 10-minute um, piece like that, then we're going to go into a sort of discussion where we're asking each other questions. And then we're going to ask for audience uh, questions as well. Or you can intervene in the, the 10 minutes of discussion questions that we're each doing. So now we're going to hand over to Dr. Robinson, who's going to help dig into these questions about uh, what does adaptation mean. Thank you.
Right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Stacy Robinson, Colby College. Just hoping to provide a little bit more context to some of the issues that Kevin just framed so very well. Uh, but before I begin, just want to acknowledge the work and contributions of Dr. Mimi oh, Shella, and of course, Don in the back, who is a champion of champions. Thank you, Don. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the challenge of climate adaptation in the Caribbean. But um, like Kevon, I am a geographer, but I'll tell you a little bit about that. But my research is essentially trying to understand the human, social, and policy dimensions of climate adaptation in 58 small island developing states, uh, 29 of which are in the Caribbean. So I work at multiple scales, primarily trying to understand how national governments across these SIDS for short are adapting to the impacts of climate change. And because they're small and have resource constraints, how they're working with other islands within a regional context to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC, which Kevin mentioned earlier, how these small islands are actually trying to attract their fair share of adaptation finance. But in my work, there is a central idea, right, that I'm working for equity and justice for the most marginalized uh, and most vulnerable countries, which are the SIDS. So as a geographer, I put my work really at the intersection of political and development geography. So just slightly different you know, from Kevin's approach. And I combine theories because of this idea that climate change is so complex, one theoretical perspective cannot allow us to understand the full extent of the problem and the diversity of solutions that we need. So a lot of my work draws on systems theory, uh, and this is based on the idea that the components of a system should be understood in the context of the relationship with each other rather than in isolation. And I do get a lot of flack for this, but I draw on world systems theory as well because of this idea of the unequal exchange of labor and resources between the core countries, so the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, and countries in the periphery, right? The developing countries, the small island developing states, or SIDS. And another theory that I draw on a lot is resource dependence theory. And the idea there is that organizations or countries, they have to work together and they have to acquire resources from each other. But that exchange is often quite problematic. So most of my work is qualitative, but I do a little fancy modeling every now and then to keep <laughs> relevant, as you know how it goes. All right, so adaptation, like any good academic, we have to start off with a definition, right? So for me, I draw on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their definition of adaptation, which, to my surprise, not everybody agrees with. But here it is, a process of adjustment, emphasis, to actual or expected climate and its effects. So in human systems, adaptation seeks to moderate or avoid, avoid harm, but in some natural systems, notice not all natural si systems, but just some, human intervention may facilitate adjustment to expected climate and its effects. And I've emphasized the process of adjustment because I want to signal that, yes, it's a process, but sometimes it's difficult. Where does it start? Where does it end? How long does it go on for? What are the cycles? How do we know if it's working? How do we know when to change course? These are all very, very complex questions. And I've emphasized actual or expected as well because what that says is that some of these impacts we can actually see, we know they're happening, but some of them we expect and there's a lot of uncertainty around what to expect. But to understand adaptation, we need to understand the types. Like, how are we categorizing the types of adaptation? Again, I'm drawing on the IPCC report, and essentially, it understands adaptation as these two types. The first type is incremental adaptation, where our actions um, 
are really seeking to maintain the essence of the system or the integrity of the system at a given scale. But incremental means we're just doing a little bit more than what we usually do, right? So if we have early warning systems, if we're adapting incrementally, it means that we have better early warning systems. And this is very different from transformational adaptation, which is a second type of adaptation that the IPCC uh, report focuses on. And this is where we're trying to fundamentally change the system or change the fundamental attributes of the system. Now, this is quite emergent, but it means we're doing things completely different from how we've normally done them. And the example that I like to give is, for example, you have a fishing community uh, in the Caribbean, and in order to adapt, they need to move inland and become farmers. Transformation. Here is how I summarize the challenge of adaptation in uh, Caribbean SIDS, but SIDS more broadly. It's challenging and critical because of this idea of disproportionate vulnerability, and Kevon started talking a little bit about that as well. So if we are to take the dictionary definition of disproportionate, it means too large or too small in comparison to something else. So if you read my work, I'm on this soapbox, right? SIDS in comparison to landlocked countries are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. But if we're looking at vulnerability in the context of SIDS, we have to focus on exposure. A great example is countries that are low-lying are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change than high volcanic islands. If we're thinking about uh, sensitivity, countries with high coastal populations are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And if we're thinking about adaptive capacity, countries with complex colonial histories are gonna be more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So I did a little bit of research on this in terms of what are the trends in Caribbean SIDS with respect to adaptation. And what I found is that most countries are actually responding to hurricane intensity, as Kevin identified, storm surges, coastal inundation, and then changes in rainfall patterns, air and sea surface temperatures, and drought conditions. But what this says to me is that communities facing other climate impacts are left out. It also says to me that coastal communities are prioritized, which means that inland communities are marginalized. Another thing I found was that countries are responding to economic constraints in very significant ways. Um, not so much social factors, um, a little bit about the impacts of recreational and development activities, and then pollution and waste. So for me, I'm thinking that economic issues are perhaps the biggest constraint on climate action, but also that addressing social issues does not form a big part of adaptation action, and Nigel is gonna tell us about how that manifests in education. But I wanna take a side note, and Kevon mentioned this in his talk as well, this idea of competing development priorities. And I mentioned that I do a lot of qualitative work, and I got these two great quotes from two policymakers that I interviewed some years ago. One said, for example, the national security policy identified 90 threats to Jamaica. The impact of crime is 15 times higher than that of earthquakes. The cost of crime is 7.5% of the country's GDP. A hurricane costs about 2% of a country's GDP ever, every few years. And these issues actually do more harm than any other threat. Another policymaker said, Eight out of 10 of the most violent countries in the world are in Latin America and the Caribbean region. The extent of this problem is quite horrendous. Just a side note. All right, back onto trends. I found that vulnerability and impact assessments are the single most commonly reported adaptation action. What does this mean? This means that most countries are still heavily involved in what we call groundwork adaptation. So we're just adapting incrementally, but really we haven't started doing the real adaptation. 
So country, uh, countries and communities are only now starting to play catch up. Another interesting thing I found was that national governments are coordinating adaptation actions with other country governments. So lots of bilateral relations at play. They're also working with regional and sub-regional organizations and with international organizations. So this says to me that governments to which international funds are channeled rarely coordinate their actions directly with local communities, and this creates challenges for agenda setting. I also found that intermediaries are very common, and this signal challenges for controlling resources. All right, so in terms of other adaptation trends, the highest number of adaptations are being undertaken in the coastal zone, followed by forestry and agriculture, tourism, and the water sector. So for me, adaptations that also benefit economically beneficial sectors are the adaptations that are being prioritized. People and communities involved in other sectors, therefore, are marginalized, and penultimately, Adaptations in the finance sector only account for 7% of actions. So for me, this was equally surprising and unsurprising, uh, but it also signals that transformational actions are needed. We need to disrupt the fundamental elements of the system. And quickly, why this was surprising is this idea of adaptation limits. Because there's a recognition that we can't adapt to every climate impact, and there are limits. Now, for SIDS policymakers in the Caribbean, that number one limit is money. So we need to focus on how we access money, how we deliver money, and what we do with money when it comes into national uh, coffers, and how that's shared in local communities. So I'll stop there so we can talk a little bit more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. And now we'll move on to a, another brief 10 minute talk by Dr. Brissett from Clark University. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, as you know. Or as you've heard, um, just from up the road, Clark University. So it's really good to be invited to my neighbor's house for <laughs> um, an afternoon feast, you know, <laughs> and knowledge and ideas. Um, so thank you really for putting this, helping to put this together, leading the, uh, you know, the efforts to put this together. And thank you, Don, again for your, you know, your wonderful work. Uh, so I. Um, my, my, my research area is slightly different from my colleagues here. I am an educationalist, and this sustainable development uh, forms just one part of my work. And I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to try and capture a particular line um, of argument I make in my broader, in my broader research. And, um, you know, just an example, I've highlighted some of the articles here that I'm, I'm gonna draw on, just in case you want to look at them for greater nuance and detail in how I deal with the, 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 the issue I'm gonna talk about here. And by the way, this is the fanciest slide I'm gonna have, so if you want to admi admire slides, please admire this one. Uh, we, I probably don't even need slides, I just use them because I'm bowing to peer pressure. <laughs> All right, so. So my talk, the, the, the brief discussion is entitled Interrogating the Climate Education for Sustainable Development Discourse. And uh, what, I try to, what I'll try to do here is really to provoke thought and discussion and just to consider the values that are embedded in, in climate efforts, especially the, the educational discourses um, that, underpin, that underpin it. Uh, and I made the argument, um, I made the argument that we cannot separate environmental challenges from socioeconomic conditions and aspirations of Caribbean societies, given the history of exploitation of both their environment and people. 
And it's similar, and I think my talk really comes at a good time because you have made uh, th those points in very um, you know, um, structured uh, ways which I can draw on. Yet the current dominant climate and sustainability discourse and the related functionalist education paradigm do exactly that. That is, the environmental discourse has been colonized to reflect Western, uh, the Western white gaze like previous development efforts and is largely lacking a climate justice ethos. It doesn't mean that they aren't competing discourses because we know uh, th there can be many discourses. But what I'm referring to here is a dominant discourse. Like my colleagues, they are obviously challenging this dominant discourse. Uh, this dominant education for sustainable discourse that has emerged from this has filtered down to Caribbean regional and national levels through coercive means similar to previous development um, efforts and through um, you know, previous development forces. Uh, in terms of the role of education, it is increasingly, that is, education is increasingly tied to progress in addressing climate change. For example, the United Nations notes, education, and I quote, education is a critical agent in addressing the issue of climate change. Education can encourage people to change their attitudes and behavior. It also helps them make informed decisions. In the classroom, young people can be taught the impact of global warming and learn how to adapt to climate change. Education empowers all people, but especially motivates young, the young to take action, unquote. Um, the UN also designated um, 2005, the year 2005, the years 2005 to 2014 as the decade of uh, education for sustainable development, which has also helped cement education as a legitimate stakeholder in sustainable development discourses. Um, the sustainable development goals, uh, you know, which um, you know, my co two colleagues referred to earlier, um, which are expected to influence the actions of all government policy and action, have also roped in education more tightly for a seemingly more integrative role in the United Nations Plan of Action for the Environment. Um, goal number four is, the, is SDG's uh, education-specific goal. And uh, throughout the various other goals, there is tacit, even, uh, even if just rhetorical, but there, there, there is some reference to the role of education in development um, and, and, climb, and sustainable development going forward. The World Bank, too, has, you know, couldn't help themselves. They're also joining. <laughs> And um, they note that education is critical for achieving effective, sustainable climate action. At the same time, climate change is adversely impacting education outcomes at the, at the largest finance, as the largest financier of education. Um, as the largest financier of education and the largest multilateral funder of climate action in the developing world, the World Bank seeks to harness the power of education for climate change mitigation and adaptation. So clearly, it, you know, education has become a really critical component, at least rhetorically, in, 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 in the climate change discourse, in the climate discourse. Now, if you were to look at the, any Caribbean regional or planning document, you will see some reference to addressing climate change uh, with an important role for education, which is reflective of br broader discourses as, as um, as we'll see. There are several problems with the construction of the climate change discourse and climate education specifically. Uh, but given the limited time, I'll just deal with two. Uh, the first one, the first issue is how the education for sustainable discourse reflects the broader problem I find in the environment slash climate change discourse generally, and that is the very Western, that is very Western centric. The Western environment discourse, at least rhetorically, is all about saving the planet, often with very limited recognition of the tight coupling between people and the environment, particularly for societies of the global south, like the Caribbean. For example, 
we can see the, rest of the Western resistance to reparations generally and climate reparations specifically. Um, and for those of us with that, with that interest, we can look back at the COP27 discussions around climate reparations. With the already achieved wealth of Western industrialized nations that, have, that are driving climate discourse, the concern seems to reflect their primary and singular interest, the environment, the environment, with a limited view of the ways in which the world's most vulnerable peoples, um, social and economic justice is tightly coupled with the plight of the environment. And this is why I find the notion of sustainable development deeply problematic. In fact, I don't even use that term in my, in my work. Unlike wealthy Western nations, Caribbean countries have been devastated by both colonial encounters and the processes of neoliberal globalization, resulting in turbulent societies with significant development challenges, as um, both um, Kevin and, and Stacey have, have pointed out. These are not societies in their current state that we want to sustain. Rather, they need to be transformed. The notion, and I'm not suggesting I'm speaking for these societies, but um, as a researcher and an, 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 an observer. So the notion of sustainability, sustainability, in my view, is limited and based on Western priorities and positionalities. As I mentioned before, I do not use the term sustainability in my own work. I use the term transformation. For example, education for social transformation rather than education for sustainable development. The second problem I find, and it's related to the first, is that is, that the, un is the unquestioning of the current educational paradigm and how it results in the continued prioritization of economic growth over the environment and a disingenuous representation of current educational models. For example, there is no obvious recognition of the fact that countries having the so-called better education also have more detrimental impacts on, the cl on, climate, on climate change. Or the fact that the world is the most educated it has ever been, and yet nearest to environmental breakdown. The most educated regions of the world, even though they are in the minority population, collectively consume the most, emit the highest levels of greenhouse gases, create the most pollution, right? This suggests that there is a deep and fundamental flaw in the values embedded in the existing educational model that is being promoted to address environmental problems. Yet there is little attempt to interrogate and critically reconsider the currently dominant model of education in, and its existing role in the degradation of the environment and social injustices. When such an, in, an, an inequitable uh, model of climate education is overlaid on existing Caribbean educational models, which themselves are seen as deeply flawed due to their colonial origins, long-standing inequities, elitism, and lack of relevance to the needs of the Caribbean societies, one can, cannot reasonably expect that they will either address environmental or social challenges of the Caribbean. Therefore, while climate education or education for sustainable development, as other people call it, is supposed to be a core clarion call for education to play a crucial role in, the envir in environmental preservation and socioeconomic justice. It has, its advent has not changed education's business as usual approach and is therefore in need of radical transformation for greater impact on the environment and the Caribbean people. So I come back to where I started. Right? We have two major challenges, dilemmas here. First is the Western centric, first is the Western centric focus of education for, for environment, uh, sorry, Western centric focus of education for the environment discourse that lacks integration of socioeconomic justice. And second, the flawed educational paradigms that neither advance the needs of the environment nor advocate for socioeconomic justice. Um, and in my work, I actually explore um, possible, possible models, educational models that may support 
ideas of um, social transformation and an environmental um, justice. So I'll just close here, and then we can put the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We, you'll notice we all have some questions at the end of our talks, and we're going to return to those questions um, after my brief presentation. I'm going to time myself, so I take 10 minutes. So um, I'm going to introduce some work that WPI faculty and students are involved in as part of the NOAA Climate Adaptation Program's funding for the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network. And let me apologize for not having the beautiful Jamaican accent of our previous speakers. You'll have to put up with my Philadelphia accent. Um, but we um, are very excited to be engaged in this work through our connection with this NOAA grant, which was to create the newest of the 12 regions in NOAA's climate adaptation partnerships. You'll see there's regions all around the country shaded in different colors. And on the bottom right is the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network, which is centered uh, with our lead investigator at University of Puerto Rico Medical Sciences Campus, Dr. Pablo Mendez Lazaro. And the partnerships that NOAA is creating are meant to create a relationship between researchers doing this collaborative research with communities to make usable help, information and support for better decisions and action and increased capacity, new capabilities and red readiness to help lead uh, all of the country towards novel climate solutions. Uh, this is the range of principal investigators on the project, but we have many others engaged here too, but we're collaborating with the University of the Virgin Islands as well as people at other um, universities in North America. And I'll come back to some of these researchers. We also have a number of student collaborators, and we love to recognize these students because you may know that University of Puerto Rico and University of the Virgin Islands are minority serving institutions, and the majority of their students are of, um, in, in Puerto Rico, of uh, Hispanic, uh, Puerto Rican origin. And then we're also working with students at City College of New York and Un uh, University of the Virgin Islands, and right here at Worcester Polytechnic, where we have our students in the Community Climate Adaptation Program who are assisting us in the research, as well as I'll talk about in a moment, our students in, uh, who are doing IQPs at our Puerto Rico Project Center. So the main emphasis about um, this research project is to show that the challenge of climate adaptation requires participatory, human-centered design and action. So the solutions we are looking at are really well integrated with our project-based learning here at WPI. Because first of all, we focus on people and we draw on community-engaged action research strategies to understand local needs and then act on those concerns and initiatives with the communities who are involved. We call that co-creation of knowledge, human-centered design, community sponsors of our projects define the problem, they define the approach with us, and they tell us the results they want to see. And if any of you are students here who have done WPI's IQP projects or other kinds of um, projects globally, you'll know how this uh, works where you're really embedded in a sponsor's problem and you're trying to solve it with them. We're also grounded in specific places. So instead of studying just climate adaptation at like a big global and abstract level, we draw on multiple social science methodologies that bridge technology and society to gain that deeper understanding of specific places, specific communities that are affected by climate change. That means local downscaling of these climate risks and impacts so that they're meaningful to people living in a specific place. And we're also collaborating with scientists at the planetary level who are helping us take information and data um, to understand things like complex hydrological systems, heat systems, ocean warming, um, atmospheric changes, landslides, and we're using their data 
not to just give it to people and say, oh, here, this is what's happening, but to get community partners to work with us and tell us what data do you need, what would be helpful, how can we help you, how can we create new kinds of data sets, new kinds of measurement sensors to help create a learning network that translates knowledge to action and back again. So this is the structure of the CCAN, as we call it, network. We're working both at the what we call the macro level with regional networks such as um, federal agencies like FEMA and NOAA, the National Weather Service. Um, and then we're taking the, the scientists and the science from those kind of federal agencies and the funding and we're connecting it to what we call the meso level of the territories, the U.S. territories of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, which are each um, archipelagos. They have, they have multiple islands within them. And then we're trying to transfer knowledge between Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands because Puerto Rico is actually much bigger and is actually much more organized into municipalities and into multiple layers of gov levels of government. The U.S. Virgin Islands are much smaller. They feel the impacts of these hurricanes and other effects and droughts and things just as much, but they're not as organized municipally to deal with it. So we're helping transfer knowledge between them. And then at that micro level, we're working with specific communities to help them develop their own capabilities to empower themselves, to, to get funding, to find climate financing, to do adaptation projects. So I'm going to give really quickly a few examples of some WPI projects with communities. Um, our student teams doing their IQPs at our, if for those of you who aren't from WPI, I won't have time to explain the whole system, but we've had a Puerto Rico project center for 30 years. Um, one of our co-directors is here, John Michael Davis. And we have teams of um, groups of 24 students broken into teams of four who go to work for seven weeks at a time with their faculty advisors traveling with them. So this is a project that was done last spring in La Perla, San, San Juan. And the team helped the community members create maps. And they asked them, what do you want to do with these maps? And the, with the maps, they created a catalog and, and map of their arts, their cultural heritage, murals, and they made a walking tour of that. So first, in other words, they wanted to build uh, education and awareness and knowledge of their own cultural location. And then they used the mapping tool to help create evacuation maps for emergencies. And the students coupled this with training workshops and guides on mapping software so that the community could take this and then use it themselves. Here's another project. This is um, also in last spring, developing resilience strategies in Cobuy Lomas, Puerto Rico, with a, an organization um, called Id Shalia, which takes uh, one of the, re what they call the rescued school buildings. So we heard earlier from Dr. Brissett about how public schools were um, uh, not, uh, they were abandoned and they were people, uh, the government closed a lot of the schools because the population had left and because of a lack of funding and austerity and government cutbacks, the public schools were left empty. So many, many communities have done what they called rescuing their schools and they turned them into resilient centers. So our team member helped work with this community to work on partnerships to improve energy independence, uh, water storage, communication, community awareness, and trying to raise funding. One more project I'll mention is called Advancing Community Climate Adaptation, and it's a case study on resilient centers in Puerto Rico where the students helped compare and draw lessons from two different case studies of these kinds of resilient centers drawing um, on um, the creation of a, an emergency management toolkit where the communities could do their own risk map and asset map. So those are just a few examples. These are some pictures of our students at work um, in these amazing communities. So this is really like the grassroots effort from the ground up to raise up the capabilities of communities so that they can help advocate for themselves and help their own people, which is really what they're focused on. Next year in 2024, this coming spring, we'll be doing more projects with communities um, along similar uh, aspects, including working with the NGO Para la Naturaleza to work on co-designing climate adaptation plans with communities. Um, going back then to finally to the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network, I just want to emphasize that we're working at these multiple levels. 
in um, February 27th to 28th, we're sponsoring the US Caribbean Extreme Heat Summit with a number of partners. Uh, then we will be working in January on a, um, a training program where all of the managers who are in FEMA and in municipal governments are going to learn from us about how to work with communities and how to do this kind of grounded um, stakeholder based community participatory design. So we hope to improve the relationships and the projects between these different levels. And I just want to mention lastly, the, one of our scientists on the team, Dr. Patricia Chardon Maldonado, who's um, involved in a project called CARICUS, which is the Caribbean Ocean Observatory System. Um, they have been creating an incredible amount of um, data measuring tools, right? that uh, include ways to gather information on currents, on water flows, on ocean acidification, water quality, cyclone activity, and using that information, they are expanding this network across all of the islands in this broad archipelago so that they can help create things like early warning systems, but also tools so that um, each community in different locations knows what to expect and what to, how they can predict what's happening in their area. So you use these tools and then you have maps where you can zoom in on your town, your community, your coastal area and find out what's happening there in terms of the ocean and the storm surges. Um, they have wave data buoy, oceanographic data, weather stations, radar systems underwater gliders that look at the deep ocean um, measurements as well. So this is the kind of really exciting work that as we move forward with the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network, we hope our students in their projects will also be able to get more involved with helping communities use this data, make it usable for them and useful for them. And then we're bringing um, Community Climate Adaptation Master students who this year um, Solange Huera, who's in the back right there, was doing work in Puerto Rico. In the coming year, we will have two students working in um, the Virgin Islands with our partners there. And that's part of another um, grant where we're working on collaborating with the Caribbean network and the Urban Northeast network, um, the climate adaptation program called CCRUN, to build learning across our, our regions, our region here in the Northeast and the Caribbean. That is, we want to learn from the Caribbean because we have a lot to learn here. And then we'll be cooperating with the Pacific RISA, CAP RISA, right, in the Hawaiian Islands and the other U.S. Pacific territories like Guam. And we'll be working with Local Islands 2030, which is a U.N. network of islands. Um, you can look it up here at islands2030.org which spreads across the Caribbean, the Pacific, and a couple of other island regions so that all of these small islands, territories, states, whatever they are, can start learning from each other, sharing knowledge, and building on all of this together. So thank you. I will stop there. And now we're going to transition into a discussion. So we each have questions we're going to ask each other to begin with, and then we're going to ask you guys to chime in with your questions. But um, so start thinking, get your questions prepared, get ready to ask them, um, and we'll begin with, I don't know whose questions should go first. Um, I think we might want to start with Stacy Ann's question, because I, I think that's a really important starting point. So do you want to jump in on that one? Just have a go? Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things that, um, yes, it is. <laughs> um, considering everything that I said in my initial 10 minutes and just building on what Kevin had said, um, you know, the international community is like, where do we go from here? You know, considering all the issues with financing, et cetera. And one of the types of adaptation that is being pushed right now is something called locally led adaptation, where the idea is we need to rebalance the power structures, we need to consider justice implications, and focus on the local community. Now, like any true academic term, you know, folks are wondering what's the difference with community-based adaptation? Like, 
you know, community, local, sounds pretty much the same. <laughs> um, but that emphasis is on equity and justice with respect to locally led adaptation. But there are issues with LLA for short uh, as well. And one of the big questions there is, what is local? So just as though we can question what is community-based, we can also question uh, what is local. But that should be the core component of LLA. But if we're thinking about what is local, maybe we're thinking about you know, food discourse, for example. If you're thinking about local food, it sounds organic, it sounds good for you, it sounds something desirable, right? And some of those aesthetics have transferred onto the concept of, of locally led adaptation. I mean, for me, in my work, as I mentioned, I look at these three scales, so national, regional, and international. So I don't necessarily play at the local level, but it's interesting um, because it's this idea of smaller is better, uh, smaller is also better connected. So again, we're thinking of LLA as something really good for us. And if we're looking at the multilateral financial architecture with respect to adaptation finance, we see that there's this push for local ownership. So again, everything that we're seeing is cueing us into this idea that local uh, is better. But <laughs> question. <laughs> Are we taking questions? No, not yet. <laughs> Just hang on. Right? <laughs> um, but there are many challenges with this, right? And the first challenge is this tricky concept of elite capture, mm -hmm. right? Where what we're seeing at the local level is that these power structures are actually mimicking the mm -hmm. same power structures right. at the international scale. And, and this is quite troubling to scholars such as myself and others, as we can see. Um, another problem is that we are trying to figure out whether this concept of locally led should apply or can apply to a specific geographic location or a specific place with specific spatial characteristics. Um, because what we're trying not to do is homogenize everybody, like, oh, the locally led in this place, perfect, right? Because we need to acknowledge that people are different, communities are different, we have different needs, especially with respect to adaptation, so we need to be cued into this. But, but LLA really offers us this possibility of defining scale and place in a way that we haven't done before, in a way that we've been cued to think you know, is a productive uh, pathway. So just something to think about, but especially the fact that LLA does not have to be static. We can actually see it as this continuum of action, starting with a project that can be locally implemented, or a project that can be locally managed, or locally planned, or locally owned. And then the next step could naturally be something that is locally led, where the adaptation projects are designed by local people, who would determine how the resources are used, allocated, controlled, et cetera. And those communities would be the ones that are responsible for trialing the adaptation and saying, hello, this is what works for us, because we have decided collectively how to measure our success in this instance. Yes, great question. And uh, so like when we ask what is local, um, I'll ask our other speakers to sort of weigh in on that. Do you have thoughts on what you think about when you think of local? I think that's a, um, as a geographer, we, we always think through issues related to scale. Um, for me, when I think about this question in relation to hurricane, it becomes really important in many different ways. One, in terms of how do we measure impact? Um, and in many cases, um, when you think about the indicators that we use to measure impact, particularly related to natural um, hazards, natural disasters, they tend to be large scale at the country level. So we, we look at GDP um, impacts, we, looked at, we look at death tolls, and so on. But a lot of these indicators, it's very hard to translate them down to the, to the local level. 
And so what you find is that a lot of the solutions that we, we come up with is very much shaped by these indicators, right? So there is a need to collect more nuanced community local, or locally led data, which I think the methods that uh, move towards participatory, um, kind of a community engaged kind of approaches, there's a lot of benefits with those um, types of uh, methods or measurements that can capture um, impacts at the household level, for instance. Um, the challenge, of course, with a lot of these um, methods is the ability to scale those up, right? So it's a very difficult situation when you talk to policymakers because when you, you say local, right, they're like, well, you know, a lot of the, the money that comes in has to be spent in a particular way. And so what you find is there is this issue between um, accounting for that money that requires a lot of like um, accumulated or um, um, amalgamated data. Um, but at the same time, like when you do that, there is this like gap that, that it creates that doesn't allow the, the, the funds to be connected to this like specific needs of households. And so there's this, this, this kind of challenge that, that comes with that. The other thing that, that comes to mind, particularly in kind of thinking about, thinking about the local, is the ways in which, um, when you think about communities, we normally think about them in a very kind of homogeneous way. And that, in many ways, doesn't capture gender differences. Just, um, doesn't capture sometimes even ethnicity issues, depending on the kind of country you're working with. Um, and so when you talk about locally led, I'm not sure if it necessarily changes that in terms of moving from community to local, if that necessarily solves that problem where we're still kind of, I feel like we're still homogenizing communities, regardless of whether or not we call them local or community led adaptations. And so there's this like, that, this big challenge that comes up, like um, in the case of St. Martin, um, a lot, one of the communities I'm following now is an informal community that is being targeted for involuntary resettlement. And so a lot of the, the, the people that live within this community are undocumented migrants from the DR, from Haiti, from across the, from the Caribbean. And so here is this like, um, mass um, um, kind of uh, surveillance, policing kind of program that's being masked, masked as a climate resilience building initiative. Um, and of course, it is framed as a kind of a local adaptation measure, but it really isn't. And so I'm kind of wondering in my head when we think about local, like, the shift away from community to, to local is because of the, the critiques that were levied against community. And so it's like the shift to local is in one way kind of a response to that critique, but at the same time, how does the shift to local reproduce that same problem, but just in a different um, okay. so, so Dr. Brissett, do you have thoughts on the local or you can also pivot us towards your question as well? Uh, well, um, this one. So, um, Stacey, I wonder if I should ask you if this is asked in the context of uh, a geographer or whether if you're asking an educationalist, it would be asked differently. Um, you know, could, could, it, could it be, you know, what is local knowledge? What is locally derived education? What is locally um, influenced um, knowledge systems? Um, in any way, in any case, it's a difficult question to answer because if we're think, thinking about knowledge, I think because in many ways in the Caribbean, or based on our education and educational systems, um, you know, so much of our knowledge has been colonized. Um, and we have strayed so far from um, 
valuing and an integrating um, local, you know, when, we, when, I, when I say local here, I mean geographic, um, you know, people within a community then. Um, I think we have not valued that so much. So, you know, what is local knowledge in that context? It's, it's, it's really hard to say. It's really difficult um, to say. And thinking about it here now, uh, there are so many things that, you, you know, I would have to think about in terms of, for example, how do the processes of globalization, how have the processes of globalization shaped how people view uh, what is considered local knowledge versus what is considered um, global, international, universal knowledge. Um, but I think if we were thinking of, of education in the context of um, climate and, 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 and addressing climate change, you know, I could think of it as how do people within a certain geographic space understand how they are being impacted by certain um, climate change issues and how they see themselves contributing to addressing or you know, mitigating or you know, reducing the effects of those, um, of, of climate change. Um, how can they make their lives better under the con under changing conditions over which they have, you know, sometimes limited control? Mm. I mean, that's a long roundabout way of saying that it's a <laughs> difficult question to answer. Mm. So um, that so. I, I think I mean that link between education and what's local I think is really interesting in terms of language and what kinds of language we use. Mm. And in right. work I did in Haiti, many of the emergency responders after a disaster come in speaking English or French. Right. And they did not speak Haitian Creole. Right. And, cr and if you don't work in Creole, you're not working in the local language. And, but the same, interestingly, happens in Puerto Rico. A lot of the work, a lot of the agencies are doing work in English. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, everything there has to be translated into Spanish. Mm -hmm. And it's not always happening into, an, into Puerto Rican local Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then in the, Vir in the Virgin Islands, we think of it as English speaking, but actually there's our own Creole languages in the Virgin Islands, as well as Spanish speaking and Creole speaking migrants in the Virgin Islands. So like as you get down more and more into what is the local and what's the local language and how do we respect people's own knowledge of where they're at, where they're coming from, we need to do that language work. Yeah, I could also just add that the one of the things that we recognize is that people aren't passive agents, right? So that's like the, the other side of it is that there are folks who uh, have local knowledge yeah. that, and practices that we can benefit from. Mm -hmm. And I've seen where, you know, working with big organizations like the FAO um, over the years where they're now kind of, you know, at this point where they're really building out projects that take into account what people are doing on the ground and not just like pushing um, quote unquote new um, crop varieties on folks, but actually in many ways that, um, focusing on locally and culturally important crops mm -hmm. and finding ways in terms of like building out adaptation projects in ways that one will get very good Local buy-in. I don't really like the term buy-in, but you know, you doing culturally accepted and appropriate adaptation practices that have a better chance of achieving or uh, being successful as opposed to coming in with these like top-down straight um, straight jacket kind of approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, flag the variability across Caribbean countries. Mm -hmm. Just you know, expanding from your point, Mimi, about the variations in languages. Um, one of the things I know is that there's quite a lot of variability in terms of the source of climate information mm -hmm. um, across the Caribbean because there have been quite a few knowledge and ac well, knowledge. Hmm, KAP, I know this. Knowledge, attitude, practice. Attitudes and practices, yeah. Attitude. Quite a few KAPs done across the Caribbean. 
And what we're seeing in that one country, the source of climate information might be the TV. In another country, mm. it might be radio. Mm. You know, in another country, it might be word of mouth. And there, all of that impacts how um, countries or, or you know, people in the local people see the importance of climate change and the threat of climate change and the importance of responding. Uh, just as a way of a quick example, I also do work in, in the Pacific, and you also see the variability there. But one source of climate information that's very prominent in the Pacific is the University of the South Pacific, um, which we don't see the equivalent of in the Caribbean, where the UWI, University of the West Indies, is a primary source of climate information, which is quite interesting because there's a big climate studies group at Mona in Jamaica, right? So you can ask yourself, you know, what is the role of universities in all of this in terms of generating local climate knowledge, um, you know, generating knowledge that's appropriate or important for adaptation in this local context? Yeah, and, oh, sorry. Yeah, and if, if it could, if you could add on that in a serious and facetious way, uh, we, we also have to keep in mind, <laughs> again, the processes of globalization and that there are multiple ways for people to get their information. And, um, you know, running the risk of people who watch Fox News. Um, you know, I've seen in different parts of the Caribbean people watching Fox, Fox News and they are listening to other, for other forms of um, climate information. And there's also the issue of misinformation as well, right? That can percolate and we have to keep that as part of the process, the whole gamut of information that we also have to struggle with. Not, we can't assume that everyone is gonna embrace the idea that climate change is real and that it is imminent and present and, and that it's, 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 it's deeply consequential. Uh, and so there is also the, 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 the challenges of, of, of um, working through and addressing that even as we try to <laughs> develop responses to real issues. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I was gonna add to that also like the gap between what we might call expert knowledge, yes. you know, professionals, university, popular and yeah, popular knowledge, and where does popular knowledge come from, what form does it take, but also that can it challenge some of the expert knowledge, right? When, when if we say we've got all this data and all this information and it says climate change is coming to a neighborhood near you, right. maybe people have other responses to that and we need to listen, first of all. And that brings me to that question of what is equitable community engagement yes. or equitable locally led adaptation, how do you practice it? And do you think about that, any of you in your work, how to practice that or what recommendations to give for those who want to be equitable and just in their engagements with local people? I think you, you, give, part of, you give part of the answer in the sense of we need to listen. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us um, working in the fields realize that there's a lot of knowledge that <coughs> exists and a lot we can learn from these communities by just listening. Um, and I saw this with a project I was involved with a few years ago with um, IRI from Colombia. Mm -hmm. We were developing an early warning system for the coffee leaf rust disease. So it's within the field of climate services. And one of the things that we realized was that, you know, the type of information that was being given to farmers, that was being packaged as climate information services, the, because of the scale in which they were being produced, it wasn't, those information wasn't, uh, they weren't um, applicable at the farm level. And the type of information that was given um, it wasn't the type of information that farmers were looking for. And so we had to kind of step back, we had to go back into the communities, we had to talk to farmers and then we tailored the climate information based off the information we got from those farmers. Um, and in many ways that helped because, you know, what could have easily happened is that th we developed this early warning system, we provide it, we provide this climate information to these farmers, nothing happens. And we reproduce the same rhetoric where, oh, farmers are not smart enough to take on 
information and, and do adaptations on their farms. But in truth and in fact, we were producing that problem by not providing tailored climate information that was suitable at the local level. Can we let uh, <laughs> Alejandra, we'll let you ask your question. Go for it. Does anyone want to respond to the importance of like symbolic culture and meaning for local people? Um, and also, did, did, did you want to ask one of your other provocations before we go to the audience? Or can we, do we have the time? We, we have time for one more, yeah. No, I, I just want to say I, I totally agree that, um, you know, Focusing on what communities consider as priorities might not always align with what the, mm. the, the projects or programs that we are um, a part of wants. And I think that, that, that is an issue that needs to be really taken up seriously. Um, I know for a fact that a lot of the um, farming communities we work in, what motivates farmers to get up every single day and, and farm is not always based off economic considerations. It's based off like cultural practices. People will tell you, my, my, my parents, my grandparents grew this. You know, there, there are these other kind of elements that are as important to them as the economic considerations. And in many ways, building out adaptation projects have to take those things into, into account. And so I definitely agree with that. And on the other, the other end, in terms of equitability, is also thinking about how these communities are not homogenous. That within these communities, we have to find, like one good point is, you know, surveys that target heads of households. <laughs> and like think about who, who would be the head of a household. And can that head of household actually speak for that household? And how if you take that information from the quote unquote head of household, and produce that as representative of that household, how you might be reproducing gendered violence. You know, so equitability is also kind of speaking to how we produce knowledge ourselves as scientists, as researchers, and thinking about ways in which we can kind of disrupt these like, notions of communities as being homogeneous, kind of really questioning, kind of taking for granted truth claims, um, and really kind of applying that in the methods that we use to drive our research. And that links directly to a question Nigel was going to ask us about socioeconomic justice. Do you want to add yes. a little on that? Um, so, I mean, it comes from everything we have been discussing in terms of um, the importance of uh, connecting um, climate with 
people's um, livelihoods and cultures and welfares and so on. So uh, my question is, how does your work, and in many ways you have captured this, but maybe uh, you know, being deliberate and specific and maybe in, even engaging the, the audience would be useful, but how does your, how does your work um, engage simultaneously with a concern for the environment and uh, socioeconomic justice for uh, the Caribbean people? And I, th and I think that relates in a way to the, what we call um, tra green transitions, right, mm -hmm. that are about workforce and livelihoods also. Mm -hmm. And the fact that for me, one of the bigger questions is the ways in which our so-called transition in the United States may have impact on other places that we're not thinking about. And so we need to be aware of things like lithium mining, right, in South America, but also um, other resources and energy and oil refineries um, that are involved in our energy resources here. And when we transition, whatever transition we do, it's gonna have impacts on, on across the Americas on many, many people and their livelihoods. And we, we need to look at that whole picture. I have many thoughts about <laughs> many things. I'm trying to filter <laughs> and edit. Um, but the work that I do, I've always been very clear to say that climate change is about people. And if we're not thinking about people in terms of the impacts and responses that in and of itself is an injustice. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about the question that we got from the audience just now. And what I'll add to that is that our conceptualization of the impacts and our responses, in addition to centering people, also need to be rights-based. And I'm thinking about this particularly with questions of relocation, right? Uh, Kevin gave a great example earlier, but you know, and, and I'm drawing from the Pacific a little bit here where you know, whenever I give a presentation, there's somebody without fail in the audience will ask, why don't these people just move? Every time, you know, all the time. And I love this question. Because my response is, don't they have the right to choose? Mm -hmm. And in the Pacific, there's this very deep and, and strong connection with the land mm -hmm where you know, those cultural practices um, exist. They need to be honored in a way that's honorable as well. But what I've observed is that many of these project teams um, you know, related to adaptation, they almost never have an anthropologist on the team, right? Um, you know, so we have you know, perhaps engineers who are trying to model you know, the inhabitability of a place over a specific period and will determine that these people have to move, right? But what about their right to stay? And this sort of conversation, you know, these questions are sidelined and I think this is my calling, right? It's everywhere I go, what about their right to stay, to choose, to to honor their connection um, with the land. And I think that needs to be shouted from the mountaintops. That's my shout. That's awesome, <laughs> great. So we're gonna now switch over to our audience to ask some questions. And we would love to hear from some of the students in the room especially, and we would be happy for you to connect it to other regions. It can be Latin America, Asia, wherever, Africa. Uh, Varun, you're up. Stop me. 
Is that a broad <laughs> question? Is, yeah. yeah. You want me to go? Yeah, this one, yeah. I'm going to get myself yeah. in trouble. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things that I ensure I engage with, are, are you a student? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, right. So one of the things that I usually try and engage with, with my students in, I guess, pretty much all my courses, but especially for, in a dis research design course, is the importance of understanding power as yourself and positionality as a researcher. Because even though you are, uh, they may see you as part of the community and you may very well be part of the community, you can also be very extractive in how you engage with that community, right? So we have to be careful, Go any of us going into a community and exercise a certain amount of intellectual but also moral humility to, to look at the power dynamics and see how we, the power and privilege you have may be inadvertent, inadvertently be used by you to extract and even further um, exploit a community. So, uh, I mean, that's, and so, uh, you know, that as part of your training going in the field, that's something you would engage with. But consciously on an individual level, um, you also have to make a conscious effort to self-examine um, power relations, uh, how you engage with that community, what are the potentials for, um, for being extractive in your, in your research, and uh, therefore find ways that you're not simply extracting knowledge. Because in, in many ways, you are working from certain Western perspectives as well. So the power is both institutional and individual. And you have to be careful how you balance all of those as you engage in, in communities. I'm happy Nigel went first. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of anecdotes. Oh, OK. This is also a good thing. <laughs> if you can finish your thought, and then, we'll, and then we'll come to your question. Yeah, I got this question recently, right? A, a group of. Um, US-based students who are interested in the Caribbean and want to do work in the Caribbean. Um, but they're Caribbean by heritage, so maybe their parents were born in the region or grandparents, but they, they have this affinity to the region, and that was their question to me. You know, how can they engage in a way that is ethical, you know? But also they had this concern that they were not in a position where, where they could engage with the Caribbean because there was this distance, you know, a couple of degrees of distance between their direct connection to the locality, you know, through heritage. And one of the things that I said, and I'll paraphrase here, is that, you know, we have some colleagues in the academy who really their interest is Africa but it's probably expensive to get to Africa. And they study the Caribbean because it's closer, um, more cost effective, you know, more efficient. And, you know, this. Keep it up, <laughs> you're not getting me a record for that. <laughs> you know, but, but there's no real connection there. And somehow they are particularly empowered to do this kind of work. So this is why I love Nigel's response in that we all need to be guided by certain principles, right, that are ethically based where we understand the positionality from different um, perspectives. So, so that's what I'll say. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to bring up no, no, no. This is all here, good. So this is all good. <laughs> This is a question for everyone, all you guys. Uh, 
Uh, do you think the world as a whole is doing enough to combat climate change, or do you think more should be happening? First question. Do you think we are doing enough? No. I, let, let me be clear. I, I, let's not put all the world in one basket. <laughs> the global north is not doing enough. In fact, the global north is responsible for most of this problem, and they are making the least amount of efforts. Um, and I have to include myself here because I'm in the global west. But we have come, become used to this lifestyle and of you know, this consumerist lifestyle. Um, and I don't, be, I, I don't think we are sufficiently aware of the damage we are doing. And we are so comfortable in our privilege. And we still have not accepted um, how others are paying for the, 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 the wonderful life we, we live. And so no, the global north is not doing enough. And if I'm gonna add, if you look at all indicators, we're not doing enough. We're going to meet, we're gonna breach the 1.5 target. And what the 1.5 target is, is the increase in temperatures since the pre-industrial yeah. era. And so we've been seeing this constant increase in carbon emissions, particularly since the 1950s with a switch towards fossil, to fossil-based fuels. And what we've been seeing, especially in the last few decades, is just an increase in the rate of carbon emissions. So we're going to breach that 1.5 target. It's going to two, and it could go in beyond that before the end of this century. So based on those indicators, we are not doing enough. There's also a bigger argument that ties, that ties into Nigel's um, provocation about which world are we trying to save. And the bigger question is, have there been other worlds that have already been destroyed? And what can that tell us? And so when you talk to indigenous folks, they will tell you, well, we've already experienced the apocalypse. We've already been, you know, if, if you were to think of the first signs of climate change, you'd see that major dip that marked the major decline in indigenous folks in the Americas. Um, and then if you kind of follow through, there's this bigger story that there's no singular humanity. Um, and so here's this big question when Nigel talked about the global north, that a lot of the responsibilities actually have to be placed yep. on the global north because the Caribbean contributes less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet still, it's at the front line of climate change. And every funding that we get, we have to have mitigation involved in it. But mitigation is not, is, if all of the Caribbean adopts mitigation, again, only 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So again, it just shows you the kind of hypocrisy and the challenges that's kind of wrapped up with adaptation financing. Hello. Um, hi. Um, I'm coming from Cuba, so from the Caribbean, but I see the many ways in which the Caribbean gets cut into these different pieces, right, based on language, based on colonial histories. Um, and so many of the things, you know, this, this story of these hurricanes, all of this is very much the same thing that we're going through in Cuba. Um, and I wanted to ask um, Dr. Robinson, in your presentation there was kind of these two different um, approaches. One was kind of like baby, st I don't remember the exact baby terms, step. right? But baby <laughs> steps, right? Or like band-aids and then transformation. Um, and one of the things I would love to hear you talk about what transformation could look like. Um, one of the things that you said, and I, I, I don't know if I misunderstood it, was talking about what do we, what do, we do, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> with these coastal um, fishing communities? Um, and, in, and in Cuba, the idea and the plan was, you know, you move them inland and they become farmers, right? Um, and that transformation has not been well received <laughs> by the people who um, others decided they were going to become farmers. And it seemed like that was the transformation that you were um, proposing, so I'd love to hear you talk more about that. Because I've kind of, I've yeah. seen what happens when yeah. that transformation is the one that's part of the national plan. <laughs> well, well, great question. I'm happy to clarify that I was not in any way proposing this, right? This was just an example 
to compare the scales at which these two types of adaptation happen. Again, the contrast here is between incremental adaptation and transformational adaptation. I've studied these two concepts, transformation and resilience, quite closely in terms of the Caribbean. And what I found is that nobody really knows what this means in terms of how to implement it on the ground, transformation. And when I've interviewed policymakers, what I've heard is that, well, we think this concept of transformation really emerged with the Green Climate Fund, right? when they were requiring our projects to be transformational. And so we had to write our grants in a way that demonstrated this transformation. But the GCF or the Green Climate Fund itself did not explain what transformation is. So it's almost this kind of elusive um, target. And that's why one of the things that I said in the presentation um, was that it, it's sort of this new concept because we don't have you know, specific examples of, okay, this is transformation or this is transformation. But as a geographer what, geographer, what I'll say is that place is especially important, right? And here we can think of shifting baselines. So what I normally say is that what's transformational in this location is not necessarily transformational in another location. So if we're looking for specific examples, I think that's what we need to bear in mind. What's transformational here versus over there? Um, in terms of what's required, you know, policymakers that I've spoken to have like a myriad of ways in which they have conceptualized transformation. But something that comes up is transformation of the political system. So in Jamaica, for example, there is a very strong history or tradition of you know, this kind of patron clientelism you know, that's entwined with vulnerability where you know, political leaders incentivize the inhabitation of vulnerable locations, right? So you can kind of think of it of like, you know, redistricting, you know, I don't know the American equivalent, but you're keeping people in vulnerable places because the votes are there. So if we can disrupt this political system, and just using the example of Jamaica, for example, I think in Jamaica, that's where the transformation would lie, right? Where we release ourselves of this dependence on political leaders and we, decide as a community or as a locality what works for us and we work in the systems, these new systems that we create to, to lead to the transformations that we want to see as a community or as a locality. Okay. So we have about five more minutes. Are there any one or two more questions? Yes, and here's one right here. Um, so you spoke a lot about bringing like kind of power back to communities or local areas, depending on which way you want to look at it. Um, and in which ways would you suggest kind of involving communities in their own climate management when they may be more preoccupied with other issues that may seem more pressing or at least certainly more visible, um, like food insecurity, the high levels of violence you were talking about, um, when communities are already more vulnerable because they're facing things such as that, what ways can you still allow them to participate in their climate management without taking away from those areas? I have something to say too. <laughs> well, have a go, Mimi. Well, I was just gonna say that one, one of the things we learned from Puerto Rico in their response to the hurricanes was that the community's food security is part of climate adaptation and improving social equity and helping the most vulnerable in the community and potentially reducing violence and things like that. So like, it's not an either or. It's when communities identify their own needs, they usually begin with food and water and shelter and then centers where they can get healthcare and education and that is climate 
adaptation and resilience for them, but it's also building social equity and greater justice and less violence, hopefully. To add? <laughs> yeah, I always say that in a small island context, it's sometimes impossible to separate you know, environmental objectives from development objectives. And where this gets complicated is when we start thinking about international finance, mm -hmm. right? Because if we're thinking about adaptation finance, all the rules say that adaptation finance needs to be a top development. So you hear these calls for new and additional finance, and, and that's what you know, we're saying. But you know, I think it's an interesting line to, to straddle. But I also think it's OK to say that for X community, climate change is not the most pressing challenge. Mm -hmm. That, that, that should yeah. be okay, yeah. right? Um, because again, as we've you know, demonstrated or argued that you know, communities are not homogeneous, these needs are so diverse, but the truth is sometimes there are other more pressing things and it's okay to address those issues. Every community will not be climate affected, many will be, and others will be more affected than other communities, and it's okay to say that. And can I just add to, I uh, agree totally that, so the, the aim is how can we mainstream climate change into key kind of development goals? And kind of tied to the point that Mimi mentioned, like even in Jamaica, the most, some of the most crime-ridden, um, some of the most volatile communities are also the communities that are some of the most climate vulnerable as well. And we've seen this in, like, we've had major like, dengue outbreaks. Um, a lot of those communities, for instance, in Kingston, um, that, first of all, pe the kids tend to be outdoors more because facilities inside in the homes are not as, as um, you know, the quality is not as good. So you also find that a lot of those areas, you have um, pond, a lot of like open areas where you get ponding and so on. And so you find where a lot of these like development issues get wrapped up with an ecological and environmental issues as well. Um, and so addressing one, it's not one versus the other. The challenge though, which is I think what led you to ask that question, is when policymakers say, well, Crime is more important. And there, is, there becomes this gap then where they don't see the connections. That, to me, is also another side of the problem, because you can easily read some of these, the, the, the kind of responses that the policymakers made as saying, well, you know, climate change is not as important as crime, comparing the GDP and all of that kind of impacts. But it's the question is, how can we, because like, as a researcher, I work a lot with policymakers, but also at the community level, is make that gap, the, the bridge that gap between the discourses happening at the policy level and what's happening at the community level, and showing people that these things are connected. And I think that that's very, that's very important moving forward. And the other point I just add quickly in terms of transformation, there's some really interesting things I think that's happening. You know, like. There's a lot to think through with Puerto Rico in terms of what's going to happen with the energy sector. Um, the, you know, you could think about the ways in which transformation could mean like really pushing towards um, renewable sources of energy um, that are more kind of climate resilient, moving away from having these um, the poles that are easily exposed to strong winds to going underground. You know, like building out infrastructure that. Um, is less exposed to the impacts of like wind and so on, but also moving away from fossil-based fuel could be one kind of example of becoming like a kind of a transformational change, right? But tied to that is precisely what Stacey Ann was mentioning, that you can't move towards those technologies without a kind of a change in governance, in kind of these governance systems as well. Issues of corruption are just as important as climate adaptation. And when you have governments that have poor levels of governance, um, high levels of nepotism and corruption, a lot of the funds that you might provide to those countries might never reach the communities that they're supposed to. And so you can't have transformation without really targeting governance. Governance is actually one of the biggest, biggest problems that we have to confront. 
I have two quick points. Honest Nigel had a point. Um, just quickly, in terms of where adaptation finance goes to the countries with good governance quality. So just to add to Kevin's point. And you know, just to say very clearly that you know, I believe that the changes that we need is in the governance. You know, the legal framework, the legal environment. And one quick example, because uh, Kevin mentioned Puerto Rico, is that 1920 Jones Act. Right, that requires um, you know, aid coming in after you know, post disaster situation, you know, having to go into Puerto Rico and US ships you know, flagged and crewed, etc. For me, I don't know what it will take, but that seems like a big transformation if you could repeal that act. Right? Because from 1920 to now, if we can say, OK, if there is a disaster situation, aid can come in from Cuba, for example, I think that would make a big difference. Just one, one quick point. Um, just mentioning aid, and I, you know, I see the point, but I have very serious concerns about aid and, um, and its capacity to address insignificant structural and fair ways um, climate issues, because aid has been used historically by the global north to extract the pound of flesh from the global south. It does not have a good history working with the global south. So, um, and we can think about the conditionalities, et cetera. I have very little, I'm very skeptical about it. The other thing I would want to mention is the importance of um, thinking of climate reparations. And, uh, you know, uh, reparations generally, uh, there, is a, you know, there is a big uh, move in the Caribbean around um, reparations generally, but climate reparations, I think, are fundamentally important, and the Global North have fought it tooth and nail, fought them tooth and nail, and the Global South countries continue to push. There has been some progress in the COP27, but not enough, and I think that should be an important component of um, countries going forward. Yes, and I think um, we have COP28 coming up in Abu Dhabi, and some of our students will be going there, and we are keeping a close eye on the, the arguments for um, loss and damages and reparations. On that note, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but we have a wonderful Jamaican feast in the back of the room. We invite you to join us and to join our speakers if you have any other questions you want to ask them personally, and let's give them a great round of applause. Thank you.